Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Carrie Jones, and I am the Medical Director for Precision Analytical, creators of the Dutch Test. Today, we're going to talk about comprehensive cortisol testing using the Dutch Test. But in particular, I want to go over the cortisol awakening response, which might be new to many of you. And I want to go over cortisol metabolites, which also might be new to many of you, specifically when we're looking at patterns as it comes to using the Dutch test um, with free cortisol and cortisol metabolites. So let's get ready. The objectives for this are first just to do a little quick HPA physiology recap, to discuss cortisol's role in the body, to review the cortisol awakening response, understand the Dutch test that looks at the cortisol awakening response, and of course, talk about some treatments as we move through this. Remember, stress spelled backwards is desserts and you cannot go wrong there. So what is the HPA axis? Well, it's the, of course the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. It's when any kind of stress signal comes up to the brain, whether it's endogenous or exogenous, whether it's physical, whether it's mental, whether it's emotional, whether it's chemical, and the hypothalamus releases CRH, which goes to the pituitary, and then releases ACTH, moves downstream, and of course tells the adrenal glands that sit on top of the kidney to release aldosterone, your androgens, um, your norepinephrine, epinephrine, your uh, catecholamines, and through sympathetic signaling, um, of course, some more of the cortical, catecholic, or excuse me, catecholamines, but cortisol. Cortisol is the big one that we're gonna talk about today as it comes to how the HPA axis works. So if we zoom in on those adrenal glands and we look at the adrenal cortex, it is divided up into three sections. Of course, the zona glomerulosa does the aldosterone, which we won't be talking about, but important to know when it comes to salt water balance and important to note is cortisol can bind to those mineral corticoid receptors and cause quite a lot of problems. The zona fasciculata, which we will talk about, is where you'll make cortisol and your zona reticularis, where you make your androgens like DHEA DHEAS. Then there's the medulla where you make your catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine. So let's focus on cortisol. When it comes to cortisol production, about 70% of your cortex is the zona fasciculata. So when you go back to that picture and you see the pink area, that's the zona fasciculata, it's big and thick and takes up most of the picture for a reason. Cortisol production is really, really important in the body. Now, production is important, but only about 5% or less of cortisol is circulating as free. Remember that free hormone is the active hormone. It's your free hormone that binds to receptors and does the things. Your cortisol is bound primarily to cortisol binding globulin, also known as transcortin, and a little bit to albumin, you also have cortisone, which is inactive. It does circulate and it also is bound to cortisol binding globulin. When you have a stressful event, it takes about 10 minutes for your cortisol to be made and put to circulation. Your catecholamines are stored for immediate release, right? The sympathetic nervous system kicks in and you immediately release norepinephrine and epinephrine. Cortisol does come out in the system, but not immediate. It takes about 10 minutes according to research. Once you make cortisol, the half-life is about one to two hours. This is different from your catecholamines, which should break down in minutes, unless you have a COMT or MAO issue. Then if, it's, if they're fast or slow, then you may have a quicker breakdown of your catecholamines or a slower breakdown of your catecholamines. But cortisol, cortisol takes its time, about 10 minutes to come out. Breakdown is about, of a half-life is about one to two hours. When it comes to cortisol production, as you know, some hormones are made from circulating precursors, but cortisol is actually not made this way. It is not made from circulating pregnenolone or progesterone. If you give a woman progesterone, you are not going to directly convert it into cortisol. That's not how it works. If you recall, cortisol is a steroid hormone and the backbone to steroid hormones, all of them, is cholesterol. It's the very first step in all of the biosynthesis. And in fact, you need the star protein to bind to cholesterol and then move through in a stepwise pattern. Most of this occurs in the mitochondria of the cell that is making cortisol, of course, the zona fasciculata. 
And so as far as we know, the mitochondria are not stealing from each other. So I know that several people um, believe in, in, the, in a pregnenolone or a progesterone steal um, when it comes to hormone production. But in, in, as far as we know, there's, there's no, um, like I said, stealing in the mitochondria. So for example, if the lutein cells are making progesterone and the uh, zona fasciculata is making cortisol, those two mitochondria are making their hormones independent of one another, so to speak. So it's not like the lutein cells are competing with the mitochondria in the zona fasciculata to make cortisol. They can make the hormones at the same time. And regardless of that, you have to have cholesterol binding to the star protein as your first step. Now, I will get asked, but doesn't pregnenolone and progesterone help? It does, absolutely. But it's from a different mechanism of action. How is cortisol metabolized? Well, first of all, cortisol can flip back and forth between cortisol, which is active, and cortisone, which is inactive, through this enzyme known as 11-beta-HSD. 11-beta-HSD1 converts cortisol into cortisol. It keeps it active. 11-beta-HSD2 deactivates cortisol into cortisone. Why would the body do this? Well, as I said, cortisol has the ability to bind to mineral corticoid receptors, which can be a real problem with your saltwater balance, blood pressure, sw swelling in the body, things like that. And so to protect itself in areas that are highly concentrated with mineral corticoid receptors, the 11-beta-HSD2 will kick in and you will make a lot more cortisone. There are supplementation ways that we can um, affect this greatly. For example, many of you are familiar with licorice or glyceriza. Gly glycer glyceriza or licorice, not, not DGL, not, the, not with the glycerizin taken out. Um, that's used for ulcers and upset stomach and things like that. But actual licorice is what helps keep cortisol active. It, it increases 11-beta-HSD1, whereas those people who have a high amount of 11-beta-HSD1 and you're trying to temper that, supplements such as magnolia and skullcap and jujube um, help to convert it over to cortisone. So depending on what you're looking to do in the body or what's going on, we can sort of use different supplements to help um, modulate this. Once you have cortisol or cortisone, they have to get degraded. They are degraded, cortisol is degraded into THF or tetrahydrocortisol. Cortisone is degraded into tetrahydrocortisone or THE. And so in urine testing, uh, whether it's dried urine, which is what Dutch test does, or even 24 hour urine, you will often look at THF and THE, and you will often look at um, the balance between the two so you can get an idea of the activity of 11-beta-HSD1 and 11-beta-HSD2, which is immensely helpful. When we're talking about cortisol disease states, I always want to make mention of Addison's and Cushing's. Please don't miss them. Addison's disease, of course, is the autoimmune disease of the adrenal gland, resulting in too little production of cortisol and aldosterone. Cushing's syndrome is the opposite, excessive amounts of cortisol in the body regardless of cause. We know this is commonly, most commonly due to steroid use, whereas Cushing's disease is when there's excessive cortisol due to a tumor, a cortisol producing um, uh, tumor. And so make sure you understand or you're looking at Addison's or Cushing's and so uh, and you don't wanna miss it. When it comes to functional endocrinology though, we know that generalized HPA axis dysfunction is what more commonly occurs in the system and this is what must be addressed. So you don't wanna miss the big disease states, but what you're gonna be working with is this generalized HPA dysfunction. So speaking of dysfunction, what's the first thing to get sort of out of balance? It's usually the circadian rhythm. What is the circadian rhythm and why is it important and what's considered normal? So it turns out with the circadian rhythm, it's very light, dark related, as you know. So in the morning, your cortisol starts to rise and then it falls. Once it hits a peak, it starts to fall in the afternoon. And then of course is quite low when you go to bed at night in the darkness. And so you have this natural up down pattern that occurs throughout the day. And any dysregulation in this can affect how you feel, your immune system, your, your, your sex hormones, your sleep cycle, your reproductive rhythm, all sorts of things, right? It can really affect everything in the body if your circadian rhythm has been thrown off. Now, if we zoom in on the morning, we're looking at the cortisol awakening response. 
So what's the big deal with a cortisol awakening response? Why do you care about knowing this? Why do you care about testing this? And, and why is the testing that you're probably currently doing um, not covering some of this information? Well, here's the thing on a morning rhythm. The cortisol awakening response happens in about 30 minutes of waking. So when you open your eyes in the morning, whether you want to or not, there are a whole number of processes that happen in your brain that convert you from conscious to alert. And it takes about 20 to 30 minutes. Now, some of you might think to yourself, no, it takes me about two hours and two cups of coffee, and then I feel alert. Well, if, you're, if that's your response, then I know that you have a dysfunctional cortisol awakening response. And some of you might say, you know, when I wake up, I immediately go from zero to 60. I am very anxious and I have panic and I feel jittery and very stressed out. Same thing, I know those of you who answer that way have a dysfunctional cortisol awakening response. The thing about it is the cortisol awakening response, otherwise known as the CAR, occurs upon awakening in the absence of any apparent stressful situation or imminent danger. Well, it's supposed to occur. And what it is, is it's actually not a stress-based response. That's, that's not what its original sort of design is about. It's really honestly to get you from conscious to awake so you can start your day, forage for food, protect yourself. But it also does some other things too. For example, like lowers your inflammation and helps with glucose balance, right? Because you wake up in a fasted state. So this cortisol awakening response happening in the first 20 to 30 minutes is really important to the rest of your body. How does it really work if we take a step back? As the awakening gets closer, the pituitary increases ACTH, but there's a blunting at the end of the adrenal gland. So the pituitary is super excited and it starts to send more and more and more ACTH pulses to the adrenals and the adrenals are going, hey, not yet, they haven't opened their eyes yet. And once they open their eyes, then we can do this. Once that happens and light enters in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the SCN, your blunting is released and you move from conscious to alert over that 20 to 30 minutes that I mentioned. Cortisol rises quite sharply. It rises at about 50% um, over baseline in 30 minutes, or at least it should. And then it gradually declines through the day. So when you're looking at the circadian rhythm and you see that high point in the morning, that should be the culmination of the cortisol awakening response. But what's really important to know is how you get from baseline up to the top of that mountain. For those of you who are more visual, here's an example of using light to go into the retina to the SCN, to the hypothalamus, the pituitary of course, and then down to the adrenals. So what does a healthy cortisol awakening response look like? Now remember when we're looking at this, we're looking within the first 30 to 60 minutes. So testing is gonna be a little different and looking at the results might be a little different than what you're used to because we really have to hyper-focus in on that first hour. We're, we're zooming in essentially. So the cortisol awakening response, like I said, is that steep pitch in the first 20 to 30 minutes. You want to know, can you get at least a 50% rise over baseline? What are your actual numbers? And are you even in the reference range? And I have some examples to show what I mean by that. The CAR influences a number of things. This is why I think it is so important that we evaluate the cortisol awakening response with our patients. It helps us determine energy levels. Yes, absolutely, we look at cortisol through the whole day. We wanna see the entire circadian rhythm. But when we can't get um, from conscious to alert in 30 minutes, when people report, actually I need two hours and two cups of coffee, then I know that their energy, their stress, their resilience is not as good as it should be because that's not what the body is designed to do. The body is designed to get you into an alert state pretty quickly in the morning. The car affects your level of feeling stressed out in the morning. It affects your alertness, of course. It affects your blood sugar management. It affects your mood. It can influence how if you wake up feeling anxious or panic, depression, especially research shows melancholic depression, worry. It affects your autoimmune development and progression. If you recall, when your body is making T cells, it runs those T cells through your thymus gland. Those little T cells have to pass something known as central tolerance. And if they don't, if they fail central tolerance because they were accidentally created to be autoimmune, then it's the rise in the cortisol awakening response that helps um, trigger 
the death of those uh, inappropriate T cells. If you have a flat or low cortisol awakening response, you could be setting yourself up for worse autoimmune or even autoimmune development. The CAR affects inflammation regulation, right? Cortisol is uh, anti-inflammatory to a point. So for those people who wake up in pain, they wake up stiff, they wake up, you know, limping and hurting, and it takes them, what, 30 to 60 minutes to move around before they feel better. It's because they're waiting for the car to kick in. Now, if the car doesn't kick in, they may report that a lot of their, their pain symptoms, their inflammation symptoms are worse in the morning. Same goes for infection. Memory and recall. The cortisol awakening response has a lot to do with memory and recall from the day before. So if you're listening to this webinar and you're trying to think about it tomorrow and you can't entirely recall what I said, possible you have a cortisol awakening response issue. And lastly, it can impact cancer outcomes. We know that those with breast cancer and even prostate cancer have an earlier mortality if they have a flat slope in their cortisol line and their cortisol rhythm. And the same goes with the cortisol awakening response. If, if their car is more flat or going down and the rest of their pattern is down through the day or flat, they have an in, um, increased mortality, unfortunately. So as I say, if you can't get your car right, how do you expect to get the rest of your stress response right? And I give you my forest analogy. It's the traditional four-point cortisol that so many people are doing is like looking down on a forest from a helicopter. You can see the entire forest, but you miss some of those key details. When you add in the cortisol awakening response to your cortisol test, so we, we continue to test throughout the day, but we also add in some extra markers right there in the morning, you get an up-close view of that forest. You get to see the trees, the plants, the shrubs, the ground cover, and the animal life. So you get a lot more detail about your patient when you're doing car testing. So how do you measure the cortisol awakening response? Is it blood? Is it saliva? Is it urine? And because you have to do three rapid collections right in a row on waking, we have what's called the Dutch Plus. It's a combination of using five salivary collections six if they have insomnia and they want to do an overnight sample and we include the dried urine collections for all the sex hormones and what we're going to talk about in this webinar are the cortisol metabolites so it's five salivary collections because it's the set the saliva part makes it for rapid easier more accurate collection and with dutch we use the salivate swabs and then we include with that four dried urine collections that they'll do throughout the day we do offer the car by itself, four points total. So the three points in, in the car in the morning, the afternoon point, and then of course the going to bed point. So if you just wanted to look at a car on somebody, maybe you already have some of their other hormones and you just wanna evaluate this, the, the trees in the forest, then you can do this test by itself. Now it's important to note the, the collection is pretty critical. It is done in saliva, like I said, and your first collection should be done immediately on waking. You will have to educate your patients that they cannot wake up and play on their phone. They cannot wake up and talk to their partner in bed or talk to their kids or snuggle their dog. They actually need to, when they wake up, they need to roll over, grab the salivate swab and put it in their mouth and get it wet. Once they get it wet, they pop it back in the tube, set the timer on their phone for 30 minutes and 30 minutes later, they do the exact same thing again. At this point, they're to get up and go on with their day. Once they do the second collection, put the salivate swab back in the tube, they set their alarm on their phone for 30 more minutes. This will be 60 minutes after waking. They're still up and about going on with their day and they'll collect then as well. So it's waking 30-30, very quick. Really tough to do a blood draw for this. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants three blood draws in the morning. Plus, how are you gonna do a blood draw on waking? And let's be honest, you cannot do urine collection on this for two reasons. One, most people cannot urinate three times in 60 minutes. And two, when it comes to urine testing, it has to go through the kidneys and into the bladder and out, and that's a time delay. So we do wanna use the saliva. Now we do a fourth collection around dinner and a fifth collection at bedtime, and then we pair it with the, all this with the information we get off the dried urine, so you get more comprehensive information. The reason at, we at Dutch have chosen the salivate swabs versus uh, spitting or drooling into saliva tubes are for a few reasons. One is easy collection. It is literally looks like a cotton swab and you pop it in your mouth. It is a truer car result because you do need to collect um, really pretty quickly. You have less than five minutes to collect 
um, at each point. So waking at 30 and at 30 minutes after that, you can't be taking 15, 20, 30 minutes to spit into a tube because as soon as you finish, you'll have to turn around and do it again. This is a rapid collection and it's convenient for those with dry mouth. A lot of people, especially first thing on waking, they have a tough time coming out with um, spitting into a tube and by popping the swab into their mouth, it's a lot easier. With the tube, as we know, um, why it can be great for something just like um, when you're looking at maybe hormones uh, and you don't need to worry about getting collection in less than five minutes. Um, when you're passively drooling, as I said, that takes time and you may not get an accurate car. Some lab companies do advise that you rinse your mouth with water prior to collection, which when you come when you wake up in the morning to do this, you're missing precious time. You need to wake up when your eyes open. You want to catch that baseline right away. With Dutch, like I said, we make it pretty easy with the swabs. What are the benefits of the car? Well, here's the thing. So here's here are two examples. So um, on the people on the person on the top and the person on the bottom. So if we look at the person on the top, they did both a urine-free cortisol on the left and a salivary-free cortisol on the right. And everything is flat. Everything follows the same pattern. Everything you know is nice and low, no matter which test you were to choose. Dried urine or, or doing the salivate swabs, everything is low. But the person on the bottom, that B point, which is collected on the Dutch test after uh, two hours after waking, when we zoom in and have the same person collect looking at the cortisol awakening response, their cortisol awakening response is quite low. So it's not as flat as the urine makes it out to seem. So the addition of the car shows that patient B, the bottom patient, has more HPA axis resiliency compared to patient A, but patient B is below the reference range. They still get that rise in cortisol. They're still able to have a cortisol awakening response. They're just below the reference range. So they, they, they can do it, they just need more oomph. So if we, can, if we go back, we can go back here. So patient A, who, who also did the cortisol awakening response, they're the top patient. They're flat all across the board. The patient A, I'm worried about autoimmune. Patient A, I'm worried about breast cancer mortality. Patient A, I'm worried about energy and resiliency, alertness, anxiety, depression, mood. Um, all of those things I would be worried about because they just sort of flatten through the day. Patient B, like I said, they're still below the reference range. They still need more power, but I'm not as worried for them about autoimmune. I'm not as worried for them about cancer outcomes because they do have the ability to get a rise. I just need to help it become stronger. I'm going to, I don't need to be as aggressive in my treatment for them as I might for patient A. In this example, patient A, we did also a, we'll back up a little bit. Patient A did a combination as, and B did a combination of urine and the cortisol awakening response to show the difference. So patient A, you can see the rise. Um, they're the, the line, of course, in the blue shaded area. And when we added in the cortisol awakening response, patient A looks about the same. Their cortisol awakening response is pretty good. Now patient B has this high spike, which we now have circled in red. They actually have an exaggerated stress response. Now an exaggerated stress response can worsen somebody's melancholic depression, as an example. Patient B actually reported that they have depression, particularly in the morning, and it gets better as they go through the day. Well, as we know, cortisol is one of the big um, shifters of tryptophan away from serotonin and down towards the kynurenine pathway. So if you're getting less serotonin production and you're going down the kynurenine pathway instead, if tryptophan is you know, pivoting and, and shifting pathways because of that high cortisol, then melancholic depression could be a potential outcome. And in this case, that was the thing. The person said, I actually have a lot of depression in the morning. So by addressing the high cortisol right there within waking, waking plus 30, it can really impact somebody's ability to make serotonin and impact their mood. So if the car is best, why should we use urine? Why, why, would, why, would you, why wouldn't you just stick with the saliva salivate swabs? Well, the reason is we want those cortisol metabolites and you can't get cortisol metabolites in saliva. You can't get them in blood either you have to wait until they get through urine testing. Why is it helpful to know this? Well, it's helpful to know this because metabolized cortisol represents about 80% of total cortisol production and clearance through the, through the uh, liver and kidney and out. 
And so if you have an idea of if the person can even make cortisol in the first place versus what's free, in this study they said free was about 1%, but you know, it depends on the study, they say less than 5%, then it really gives you some good answers is as to can my patient even make cortisol? Whether they're free is high or low, whether their circadian rhythm is normal or not, like you wanna answer the question, can they even make it in the first place? So by knowing this, we can put the two together. We can put that free cortisol together with that metabolized cortisol and get a much bigger picture. And when the free and the metabolized cortisol aren't pointing in the same direction, it just is extra confirmatory to you as a practitioner on what you need to do. So let me give you some examples. I'm actually gonna give you four patterns as it relates to the Dutch test to give you an example of what I'm talking about. So pattern one is when you have high free cortisol and high metabolized cortisol. Basically, it's just confirming, because both these dials are high, that they have a high output of cortisol. They are making a lot of cortisol, they are clearing a lot of cortisol, and they have a lot of free cortisol floating around. This person is fired up for whatever reason. Now, treatment considerations, this is an excited HPA axis. We'll, we'll cover just some treatments, obviously, a, a treatment lecture will take much longer than an hour, but I wanna make sure you're sort of pointed in the right direction. Of course, with any person who has elevated cortisol, you wanna address those root causes. This is just a small sample of a list, just to remind you, if they're on cortisol supplementation, such as Cortef, if they have stress in their life, physical, mental, chemical, emotional, what have you, any acute inflammation, acute pain, infection, stealth or overt, blood sugar, insulin dysregulation, caffeine stimulant use, it's amazing to me the number of people that live, literally live on caffeine. And when you ask them about caffeine, they report their coffee consumption in the morning, but they forget to report their um, soda habits in the afternoon, their energy drink habits in the afternoon. Um, and when you point that out, they're like, oh yeah, I forget about that. Uh, it's amazing how people associate caffeine with coffee only and, and with nothing else. So oftentimes you have to ask. Poor sleep hygiene. If they can't fall asleep, if they can't stay asleep hyperthyroidism, and of course, Cushing syndrome or disease is just some examples. Now, if you have somebody with high cortisol, of course, the number one thing we want to address is functional medicine practitioners or lifestyle. So you're going to work with them on things like meditation, breath work, journaling, yoga, heart math, respirate, vagal nerve exercises, which we'll talk about, oxytocin, which we'll talk about. Be careful with EMF and cell phone exposure. There's some research out there to show that it's it can be really thickening to the zona fasciculata um, in the adrenal glands, um, cell phone exposure. This was done in rat studies, but still, you know, as the research comes out, we just wanna be careful. So I tell people, if you use your phone as an alarm clock at night, please put it in airplane mode and, and make sure the Wi-Fi is turned off. And they can be done all through the day as needed. So what stimulates the vagus nerve? So many things. End your shower in cold water. Dip your face in cold water. So if you wake up in the morning really stressed out and anxious and jittery and you know um, pacing and worrying, uh, ready to go, already at a 10 out of 10 when you need to dial it back to a two, just get up and rinse your face off with cold water. Or if you take a shower first thing in the, in the morning, you know, take your shower and end it in cold water or cooler water. You wanna have your body sense um, a difference between the warm water and the cool water. Put on your favorite song, sing, laugh, chant, hum loudly. Louder's better, you want that vibration. Gargle, gargle first thing in the morning. You can do the Valsalva maneuver, hold your breath and bear down for a few seconds. Not my favorite, but it is in the research. Meditation's always a great one. Find a nap, even just five or 10 minutes can be really, really helpful. Anything that addresses the gut to address the vagus nerve, yoga, rhythmic breathing, and laying on the right side. What increases oxytocin? Physical touch, but meaningful physical touch hugging, kissing, cuddling those you love, including your pets. Sometimes I find that when you, when you cuddle your pet, it's actually better <laughs> than your family members because your pets give you, well, most pets, not all pets, most pets give you that unconditional love. Whereas when you go to hug your children, sometimes they're like, oh, fine, <laughs> let's make this short, don't touch me. And you don't get that same oxytocin release. But when you hug your dog and your dog is just, you know, your whole life, then you get tons of oxytocin release. I actually have a picture of my dog uh, on my main screen on my phone. And every time I look at it, I know I'm getting a huge oxytocin release. My, my family is, is the next picture, but my dog is the immediate picture. Words of encouragement and appreciation, genuine laughter, not just typing out LOL. Meditation and prayer, 
eat, drink, and be merry with your friends and family and breastfeeding. So if you have really high cortisol in the morning, if you're feeling really stressed out, you know, work on some of these things. Find some genuine laughter, snuggle your pets, work on words of encouragement to yourself, write yourself sticky notes, appreciation to yourself, or tell people, tell people around you, your family, like, look, I need this in the morning. Give me this word, these words of encouragement and mean it. Meaningful is what's important. High cortisol supplementation considerations. Um, of course, this is a very, very, very abbreviated page, um, but I just wanted to give you some examples. General support, things like vitamin C, great antioxidant um, in the creation of cortisol, the, the adrenal gland uses vitamin C. Magnesium, fish oil, B vitamins, especially B5 and a multivitamin. Calming amino acids, so think like L-theanine, glycine, tryptophan, or 5-HTP. 5-HTP is technically not an amino acid, but you know what I mean. And serine. And then botanically, you're looking at things like skull cap, magnolia. Both skull cap and magnolia actually um, inhibit 11-beta uh, uh, HSD-1, so it can push the body more, a little more towards cortisone to, to chill them out for a while. Ashwagandha is a wonderful one. Passion flower. There's some research to show that passion flower might be um, as effective as something like uh, Xanax or Alprazolam. Maca can uh, decrease uh, ACTH, therefore decreasing cortisol. Maca is just a really good adaptogen in general. Great for the hormones as well. What about pattern two is the complete opposite, low free and low metabolized cortisol. Well, this just confirms everything's low. The pattern's low, free is low, production is low. Everything's low. Now, it could be Addison's, make sure you, you know, if it's real low, if it's near if it's near zero, make sure you get that further tested. But it's quite possible there are a whole lot of other reasons. So what can you do or what should you do for low cortisol? Well, make sure you address the root causes. Make sure they're not on any suppressive medications. Steroids are a big one. Opioid pain medications, even the occasional opioid pain medication, they are ridiculously potent. You want to make sure that they, um, your patient is uh, not on them or has been off them for a while before testing. Um, Accutane or isotretinoin, which is often used for acne, can um, really affect the cells in the hypothalamus. Long-term stress, physical, mental, chemical, or psychological burnout. Long-term inflammation, pain, or infection. Poor sleep hygiene again. Any kind of head trauma, traumatic brain injury that affects the hypothalamus, the pituitary, or the hippocampus. The cortisol awakening response is actually driven by the hippocampus. So we have to be careful there with any kind of uh, hippocampal atrophy that will affect the ability of the cortisol awakening response. Addison's, as I mentioned, and then if there's any surgical removal of an adrenal gland. Remember, there's a cortisol feedback loop as well. If somebody has had really high cortisol for a long period of time, then the body says, oh, that's a lot of cortisol. And it feeds up to the hypothalamus and it feeds up to the pituitary. And therefore the CRH drops down, the ACTH drops down, and subsequently cortisol drops down. So it's possible by the time you see the patient, they used to have really high cortisol, for sure, when you're taking their history, and now the feedback loop is kicked in and everything has dropped down quite a bit. So just remember when you're, when you're working with patients, like maybe where they are in their continuum when it comes to um, whether the cortisol is high or low. How do you address really low cortisol? Well, it starts with the brain, right? The hypothalamus, the pituitary, the hippocampus. So everyone jumps right to the adrenal gland itself. Everyone calls it quote unquote adrenal fatigue, which we know that's not the case. In Addison's, in Addison's you have the autoimmune condition part where you have the inability to make cortisol. But other than Addison's, we're looking at brain um, uh, feedback and, and brain stimulation when it comes to cortisol production. So HPA retraining, which I put in quotes, that's my phrase. It's not a medical term, but it's used quite, I actually hear people, you know, talk about using light therapy in the morning and darkness at night. Really, you're just trying to get your circadian rhythm to come back online. You want it high in the morning and down at night. Using adaptogens, nutrients, and brain support. Considering light therapy, which we'll talk about. And any kind of light movement or exercise, you want to do it immediately on waking. Anything you do that's going to affect the cortisol awakening response Keep in mind, you have about 20 to 30 minutes on waking. So if you put somebody on adaptogens in the morning, or you tell them that you want them to, you know, do some movement, do some stretching, go for a little walk, and they, what do they do? They lay in bed, they play on their phone, they get up, they get ready, they do their thing, and then they're like, oh, oh, I should take my supplements. Maybe they take them after breakfast, maybe they drive to work, take them at work. They've missed the cortisol awakening response. So if you're going to put somebody or trying to really address that car, 
Tell them they have to do it within the first 20 to 30 minutes of waking. So let's go with the brain. Make sure you follow a strict circadian rhythm. So like I said, light in the morning, which we'll discuss, and darkness at night. Make sure your patients are off their screens at night. I know many of you are maybe listening to this at night. Make sure you're wearing your blue light blocking glasses um, and you know, put your screen on red. Uh, change the background of your screen to like more of a night mode. Get your gut healthy and work on that vagus nerve and improve any kind of blood flow and oxygenation into the brain. Why? Because your hormones travel around in, in your circulation and oxygen is really critical for brain health. So how do you support that? Well, exercise is important. Cardio to get the, the blood flowing weights, inversion poses for those who are doing them. Of course, stopping smoking, normalizing blood sugar. We don't want all that, that blood sugar to gum up the works. Any kind of neurofeedback feedback to the brain, biotuning, cranial sacral work, energy medicine that helps with energetic movement. That'll help with um, you know, uh, um, blood flow up and down, right from the head down to the lower part of the body. Speaking of which, acupuncture, chiropractic, massage, anything that affects the upper back, the neck, the shoulders, really, really helpful for just getting stimulation and getting blood flow and oxygenation again. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Test for iron overload. It could be on full on hemochromatosis. You want to be careful, those iron deposits can affect brain function. Please remember to test for hemochromatosis in both men and women. And you definitely want to test, if you suspect it, in women who've gone through menopause. Because remember, once they've stopped bleeding, that's their, their uh, release for iron every month. And so if they have hemochromatosis, I have had a few menopausal women that we figured it out. Once they went to menopause and weren't bleeding every month, um, their hemochromatosis really showed its ugly face. Same for men. Um, I've actually had quite a number of men in practice who I ran a ferritin on and their ferritin came back really elevated, which I know is an acute phase marker. But when I dug deeper, it turned out they actually had hemochromatosis. There's a hematology oncologist that I worked with quite a bit, and I would just send everybody, all my men to him when I figured out that hemochromatosis. And one day he called me and he said, how do you have all these men? What kind of practice do you have that you have all these men with hemochromatosis? What do you do? I said, I don't, I don't do anything special. I test them. Just test them. Test their ferritin and screen them, and you'll find it too. So now he does. Now he screens. He recommends screening for ferritin in men um, for a lot of his patients, which is wonderful. And again, reducing EMF cell phone exposure to the head. So like I said earlier, it can increase the zona fasciculata, but in this study, um, rats six hours, six hour, the rats were exposed to six hours a day for two months of, their, of a cell phone in talk mode. Um, and it increased cellular vacuum and delivery um, uh, in the brain and increased brain uh, temperature, which is not, not a good thing. And that when you, whenever you affect, um, you know, oxygenation or uh, delivery or any kind of blood flow into the brain, brain temperature um, for the negative, you could affect the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the hippocampus, and subsequently downstream. And again, I realized this was a rat study, which I think I have linked right there. Um, but it's also possible in humans. And I'm sure many a human has their phone in talk mode um, using an EMF device. So general considerations, again, that vitamin C, the magnesium, your fish oil, your B vitamins, especially your B5, your multivitamin. Now we're looking at brain support. So start to think of things like Bacopa. Think of your adaptogens like ashwagandha, as I said, rhodiola, panax, eleutherococcus. You could even, um, you know, the, this is just a list, a, a short example list. There are several others that I know many of you are using and thinking, well, why didn't she list that? Because I just don't have long enough time in the lecture to talk about it. Glandulars, some of you are using glandulars. I love glandulars personally. I've used them for years. I find them really quite effective. I use both brain glandulars and um, actual glandulars, thyroid glandular, adrenal glandular, what have you, ovarian glandular. Uh, be aware though, there is limited clinical research available regarding their clinical impact. So um, when you dig through PubMed on glandulars, you won't find very much. It's definitely much more um, anecdotal and experience. Get sun or full spectrum light exposure first thing on waking. Now, what does this do? This helps to reset your cortisol awakening response. So I tell people, when you wake up in the morning, I want you to get up, open your blinds, and get some full light into your room. Now, whether you have to go back to bed, whether you want to lay there for a little while and just enjoy the light coming in, that's fine. But if you, if you open your blinds or if you go outside, get up, go outside. In the morning, what I do is when I get up, I do open my blinds, um, but the first thing I have to do is let my dog out. So I let my dog out and I stand there. 
and I enjoy as you know the brightness in the morning. Now, if it's dark, depending on the time of year, I do have a full spectrum light that I will turn on. It's sitting right on my kitchen counter because the first thing I do, like I said, is come down and let my dog out. And so I then um, uh, make my tea and I turn on my full spectrum light. And then I have that right on the counter, right about it's, you know, I can, I can see it from everywhere in my kitchen. And I have that on for about 15, 20 minutes. So I get that cortisol awakening response retraining. Speaking of light, this is a really great study where they're talking about the Lux and how it improves cortisol levels. And I was reading through this, I was all excited um, and about how wonderful full spectrum light is until I get to the part that's underlined in red where it says acute suppressive effects on cortisol levels following bright light exposure for six and a half hours. And I thought, what? what? That's contradicting everything I've read. So I dug deeper, I actually pulled the study up and the study said it was lighting generated using ordinary commercially available ceiling mounted broad spectrum fluorescent lamps. And I thought, well, I bet a lot of people in this world are under fluorescent lamps in the day. So to give you an idea of what the difference is, natural light is on the left. So daylight, sunset, LED, and incandescent. And your full spectrum uh, fluorescent, full spectrum warm, full spectrum cool are on the right side. So for those of you who are all excited because you think you have full or broad spectrum fluorescent, um, it's not quite the same as daylight or even incandescent or LED. So just be aware, um, and, and in fact, it could actually be suppressive to your cortisol. And I'm sure a number of people report when they're in their office all day, they get very quite tired. Or I have people report they go into the big box chain stores that are full of fluorescent lights and they'll say, I come out of there and I feel very, very tired. And it's possible that the lighting um, has a lot to do with that as well. So now that we've talked about metabolized cortisol, when everything's lower, everything's high, what happens when the metabolized and the, and the free are different? What happens when they tell a different story? What happens when they, they face opposite directions? Well, that implies that abnormal cortisol clearance is happening. So let's look at pattern three. In pattern three, we have sluggish cortisol clearance and high free cortisol. So if you were just to look at their free cortisol, if you were just to run a saliva test, that looked at free cortisol and you've got this number back that's circled in red, you would think, oh my gosh, they're making tons of free cortisol. I need to knock them down. I need to suppress them. I need to put them on phosphatidylserine. I need to put them on, you know, theanine. I need to put them on maca. I need to get them meditating and all those great things. But then you run a Dutch test and you see that their metabolized cortisol is low. So they have, they have slow and low cortisol clearance, but actually really quite high free cortisol. So, so suppressing them is probably not the right option. It turns out when you see this pattern, the A number one most common reason is hypothyroidism, either overt or subclinical. And I can say as someone who has seen thousands and thousands of tests and gotten a lot of follow-ups and had a lot of practitioners send me results over the years, including thyroid labs, um, absolutely, hypothyroidism, we see this pattern. Now, if it's not a thyroid pattern, it could be poor liver function, and it could also be anorexia. There's some research to show that anorexia could be at play. And I have had patients who um, have a long-standing history of anorexia, even well into adulthood, and the results look like this. Now, the other pattern is pattern four, when we have a low free cortisol. So if you were just to look at this in, the, in, in saliva testing, you would think to yourself, oh my gosh, this person is very low. Maybe they have Addison's. I need to put them on all sorts of stimulatory things. I'm gonna put them on licorice or Cortef or glandulars or all the adaptogens in the world and, and get them cortisol up there. But then you run a Dutch test and you see their metabolized cortisol is actually quite elevated. And you're like, hmm, that's interesting. They have the ability to make a lot of cortisol and it's getting cleared out of the system rather rapidly. What's going on? So with rapid cortisol clearance or metabolism, we see it in obesity. We see it in hyperthyroidism possibly with long-term stress and possibly with chronic fatigue, although the research is mixed. So in this case, we're looking at supporting the HP axis without stimulating more cortisol production, but really more importantly, you wanna to get to that root cause, so obesity, hyperthyroidism, stress if it is, chronic fatigue. So speaking of thyroid, since hypo and hyperthyroid um, show up in these patterns, let's look at that. So here are two cases, two, um, these are two very real cases where everything looks low. They're both free cortisols are quite low. Both patterns are quite low. Their circadian rhythm is not healthy. 
The person on the top has low metabolized cortisol is low, whereas the person on the bottom, their metabolized cortisol is 6,550. It's really quite elevated. So we wanna treat these very, very differently. What happens with the person on the top is they were actually taking prednisone when they did the Dutch test. And the prednisone was causing, of course, massive suppression, made them look Addison's. They're not Addison's, it's, it's definitely due to the prednisone. Whereas the person on the bottom, it turned out they were on an extremely high dose of thyroid medication for whatever reason. And so when these results came back, we were looking at this, talked to the practitioner who did more thyroid testing, and went, oh my gosh, they're being overdosed. And as a result, it was showing up in the adrenal portion of the test. So if you had just focused on that low free cortisol, you might have missed the bigger picture of, oops, they're being overdosed on thyroid medication. Now, you can be overdosed on thyroid medication or supplementation, right? There are a number of very strong natural thyroid supportive supplements out there that can also induce a hyperthyroid state. And when you look at this picture, circled in red is their circadian rhythm, which is not very circadian at all. It's a very, it's a relatively um, low flat line. So that thyroid, that thyroid overdose is really affecting their ability to even have a proper circadian rhythm. Let's look at how thyroid directly impacts cortisol clearance. The scatter graph is a little bit hard to read, so I'll make it easier. As someone becomes more hypothyroid, their cortisol metabolism or clearance decreases. Let's think about that for a second. As someone becomes more hypothyroid, everything slows down, right? Your hair, hair growth slows down, your metabolism slows down, your digestion slows down, so you have constipation. Therefore, your cortisol production and metabolism slows down. On the flip side, with hyperthyroidism, everything increases. With hyperthyroidism, metabolism increases, right? Digestion increases. They can sometimes report diarrhea. They're, you know, they feel more, maybe more greasy. Their, um, uh, their, uh, when their hair sebum production increases, and so the same goes for cortisol production and, and clearance is that it increases as well. So if we go back to this case, this case where we called the practitioner and they said, oh, oops, they're on way too much thyroid medication. What they did is they repeated the Dutch test after having corrected their thyroid medication. So it took several months and several corrections, meaning that they changed the thyroid medication, retested in blood, did, you know, change thyroid medication, retested in blood. And once they were stable for a few months, we had them repeat the Dutch test. And it turns out on a proper dose of T4 and T3, their diurnal pattern was completely restored, but they still have a lot of work to do in their HPA axis. So by, by addressing their thyroid, by getting that proper, you can actually see they're really actually quite elevated in their HPA axis all around. They have an excited HPA axis for other reasons. And so by, again, peeling back the layer and getting to the root of that thyroid issue, now we can properly work on the HPA axis. Whereas before, if you had just looked at that 24-hour free cortisol initially when it was quite low, you may work to suppress, 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 and, um, or excuse me, not suppress, it looks suppressed, and you may work to drive it up higher when in fact they don't need it to be driven up higher. Their HP access is already excited. So thyroid can directly impact cortisol metabolism, and those two Dutch patterns we just went over, number three and four, you kind of want to consider treating the thyroid first, you know, looking at thyroid, the full th thyroid panel, looking at, of course, TSH, T4, T3, the antibodies, maybe even looking at reverse T3, but it's also okay to generally support the HPA axis at the same time. If we go back to this, can you give this person vitamin C and B5 and you know work with them on adaptogens? Yes, absolutely. And then once they have their thyroid you know, better balanced and you come back to it, now you can be a lot more specific in how you treat them. What about obesity? As I'd said earlier, hyperthyroidism and obesity have the same pattern. And of course, obesity is probably more common in our world now than hyperthyroidism. So what about obesity and cortisol? Well, it turns out obesity fat cells, adipose tissue, directly impacts cortisol clearance. Now remember, adipose tissue is its own um, like endocrine system, right? It makes its own hormones, it makes its own um, inflammatory cytokines, it does its own thing. And so when it comes to adipose tissue and cortisol, it's very intricately related. Unfortunately, your adipose tissue often has a number of that 11 beta HSD enzyme, and it actively increases the conversion of cortisone into active cortisol. So not only do your adrenal glands, of course, produce all your cortisol, then your fat tissue, your adipose tissue, 
the more you have, you can actually have an increase over production of cortisone into cortisol. So it's um, not very fair of the adipose tissue. But what everybody assumes is that free cortisol increases with BMI. So if somebody's BMI goes up due to their increase, is, is an example, with their adipose tissue. Now I fully realize BMI is definitely not the greatest marker at all of somebody's height, weight, adipose tissue, but um, hear me out. So if somebody's BMI increases, everyone assumes, oh, well, free cortisol has to go up as their BMI goes up, right? As their, as their adipose tissue increases. But it turns out, according to research, um, it's, it's relatively flat. When you look at this, it's like, as BMI goes up, the free cortisol, urine free cortisol in this example, um, it's kind of about the same. But as BMI increases, your cortisol metabolites seem to increase. And you can see that this line goes up, up, up. So as BMI goes up, as you see, you know, up from 20 to 30 and to 40 and even 50, um, that the, the cortisol production and, and clearance increases, which goes to show that, um, that oh, the uh, adipose tissue has quite an impact on the way that your body metabolizes cortisol. So if we look at this example, this is a flat pattern, right? Everything is flat and below the blue shaded area. And the top, the person has low metabolized cortisol and happens to have congenital adrenal hyperplasia. This is a real case. But the person on the bottom was a very similar pattern, is actually obese, and their metabolized cortisol is quite elevated, 8,799. And so we would address these very, very differently. So the metabolized cortisol helps confirm or further tell a story about your patient's HPA dysfunction. And I'm just gonna go back for a second to show this because obviously, um, when somebody is doing a, any kind of test, any kind of hormone test, they usually have a number of symptoms going on. But I would say then probably the number one and number two symptom that we see over and over and over again, number one being fatigue, energy levels, and number two is the inability to lose weight. Of course, with that comes a host of other things such as you know blood sugar and, and insulin and activity and all sorts of other hormones. I, I completely realize that obesity is not generally a standalone when it comes to uh, cortisol testing, but it is something that I want you to keep in mind that when we're looking at metabolized cortisol and then free cortisol, that we do have to take adipose tissue into play um, when, we're, when we're assessing this. And it's probably not hyperthyroidism, but they do have the same pattern and you never wanna miss somebody who is hyperthyroid. So let's summarize, let's summarize and then we can take questions. So first and foremost, there is a natural circadian rhythm throughout the day. I will say with the caveat for those of you who do work a night shift or have work continuous night shift or who do um, night shifts like three days on and then five days off, I get asked that question a lot. When you're doing cortisol testing, um, it's up to you. I generally recommend that you test while you are on the night shift what's normal for you. So if your morning is actually the afternoon, as an example, let's say you sleep until four in the afternoon, then four in the afternoon would be when you would start your cortisol testing. If you want to know though, how you do on your off days, meaning when you're back to normal, when you, when you should be in a normal circadian rhythm, up in, the, up in the sun, down in the dark, then you would just test just like that. When you, when you wake up in the morning, if you wake up at seven in the morning, then that's when you would start your testing. We have had some um, night shift workers who do both. They'll test their, when they're working night shift and they'll test on their days off so they can get an idea of how, um, Huh, healthy or unhealthy, <laughs> their circadian rhythm looks like. So I wanted to throw that caveat out there because we do get asked a lot about night shift workers and we need our night shift workers. Unfortunately, it's just not the healthiest on our body um, by, by far. The cortisol awakening response occurs within the first 30 minutes of waking and is triggered by light. Therefore, any of the treatments that you do, please do them within the first 30 minutes with yourself or with your patient. If you're gonna get light, wake up and turn on your light box, wake up and open up your blinds, wake up and go outside and get a little fresh air for the first you know, 15, 20 minutes and really try to help motivate that signaling from the SCN all the way down to your adrenals so that you make proper cortisol. The car influences a number of health factors such as resiliency, blood sugar, mood, energy, autoimmune, and more. Now your patients won't use the word resiliency, but they'll tell you that they're not as strong as they used to be, they're not as healthy as they used to be, they can't tolerate what they used to tolerate, their patience is worn more thin, they get sick faster than they used to, right? They'll, they'll tell you all these things and then you'll finally say to them, do you feel less resilient? They're like, yeah, yeah, gosh, like 10 years ago, I was so much more resilient. I felt like I could handle anything that life threw at me. 
and now I can't. Definitely worth checking their cortisol awakening response because now, as you know, you can influence it. You can influence it within that first 20 to 30 minutes, no matter what you do. Testing the car using the Dutch Plus uses saliva swabs, the salivate swabs, and you want to do that immediately on waking, 30 minutes after waking, and then 60 minutes after waking. But you want to add in those cortisol metabolites because it helps tell more of the story. And it can help point you in other directions. Maybe you didn't realize they had a thyroid issue. Maybe you didn't realize their adipose tissue had as big of an effect, right? Maybe some of these other things that are going on will really help to show you how fired up they are, how excited their HPA access is, or maybe it will really start to show you and them how depressed or suppressed their HPA access is. Maybe that feedback loop has kicked in and their cortisol is really quite low because it used to be really quite high for a number of years. And then there are four main cortisol patterns as seen on Dutch testing, which we went through. When everything's high, when everything's low, and then the two patterns when the dials face the opposite direction. But when they do face the opposite direction, as I said, they do point you in a direction of where you should go with your patient. In particular, something like thyroid. You don't want to miss that. And that concludes our talk. Thank you so much for listening. Hopefully you definitely have more knowledge and more information about comprehensive cortisol testing. And you have more information about the cortisol awakening response and how important it is. And then lastly, the urine metabolites and how they really help complete the story of your patient to give you more options on where to go and really just help you personalize that treatment for them so that they can get much better and feel more healthy. So again, I am Dr. Carrie Jones. Thank you again so much, and I appreciate you listening.